Marshall here. Welcome back to The Realignment. We have another great episode for you coming up as we get into the end of the year, approaching the holidays. I'm sure for most people, this is the near end of their working year. We hope you had a really good one. On that note, we have an episode that's perfectly suited for this conversation. It's with Charlie Roselle of the Galaxy Brain Newsletter and The Atlantic, and Annie Helen Peterson of the Culture Study Newsletter. Annie has also written a variety of really interesting books about millennials in the workplace, burnout culture, a lot of great stuff that all of us are thinking back over as we are looking at the end of the year. The book they wrote is called Out of Office, The Big Problem and Bigger Promise of Working from Home. You know, Sagar and I have been obsessed with this conversation about how work the workplace is changing. It's an example of a literal realignment. If you went back to 2019 and asked us, will most of us work from home? If you're in a white collar profession, obviously, most people will be highly skeptical. Yet, That's happened. We've seen a complete and total change where you live, where you work, and how that work is actually performed. Charlie and Annie's conversation and book is a really good look at how these factors are coming together and how things are actually changing. So a lot of really good stuff here. We think you'll enjoy this. We talk about unions, burnout, so many great things, hits everything we're interested in. Quick shout outs before we start the episode. I know we need to start cutting these intros down. Number one, this book is available at our bookshop. We have our special books of the year book list. You can find that if you place your orders before the start of the Christmas holiday. It's available in the link in the show notes or below if you're watching this on YouTube. Two, we have our Substack goes out on Thursday. I think I'll send a final Thursday one this upcoming Thursday. Finally, Lincoln Network, shout out. We appreciate you. It's the holiday season, so we're going to say our thanks. Let's get into the episode. to the realignment. Thank you for having us. Yeah, good to be here. A really important thing when we're having a conversation around the future of work is we all have to state our biases going into that because it seems as if whenever this conversation happens, a lot of personal preferences are coming in and clouding people's takes. So for example, I am going to say I'm very pro office, but that's because I hate email I hate Slack. I'm difficult to get in touch with. But if you put me in person, I perform much, much better. I'm more social. So that's a personal bias that's going to impact how I think about this. Starting with you, Anne, how are you coming into this discussion around work from your personal perspective? First off, let me say that I love starting the conversation this way because I think we oftentimes highlight these (laughs) biases over the course of a conversation, but getting it out right away is, is I think very useful. I dislike the office. I uh, was an academic and came to understand work through the lens of having a lot of control over when and how I did my work. There were negatives to that, mostly the the idea that then you can work all the time. <laughs> and I, I think we'll talk about that today. But I'm awkward. I don't like having to be in the office at a certain time. I hate commuting. You know, those are some of my natural disinclinations towards the office. But I also am not like, I never want to go into an office. I think offices are useful, but I don't think they need to be useful all the time. How about you, Charlie? So my bias is that I I like the office as well. Um, I... I've always been pretty comfortable there. I like, I get a lot of like energy from it, essentially. You know, uh, it, if I'm, I, I feel like it helps ground me sometimes in like understanding how I'm doing in my job. So like, you know, if I feel like kind of like listless or whatever, there, there's like data I'm getting there from, you know, being around other people, if I'm not do- doing well enough. And if, and if things are going pretty well, like I see that too. And I feel that, and I feed off that energy. Um, it's why actually like I've like, like, for example, when I worked at the times and I was living in Montana, I would come in, you know, a couple times a year and partially just to get that like check and like feel like grounded again. Um, so I actually, I do like it, but the thing that, you know, my bias personality bias wise is like, I also have real problems putting up walls in anything. So like that environment also can like, I found like it, it does kind of like, you know, overtake me a little bit. I do kind of get like, you know, ingr- overly engrossed and, and sort of swayed by it. 
Yeah, and speaking of Montana, the the two of you did something which I've enjoyed, which is you have written this book out of the office or out of office, but the book actually started before you went to the pandemic. This is much like Christopher Mims. He had the uh, real luck of writing a book about supply chain starting in 2018. We had a great episode with him. And then a supply chain crisis happens. So, so you are in the same category. So what I'm looking to understand here is what changed between the book's conception when you're writing about being out in Montana, working for New York media, and then the period of the pandemic that we're in right now? Like, What's the real shift that probably happened? And you could take this in either order. Who wants to start first? Uh, mm, Charlie, I think you should start. <laughs> I'll go. Um, so, you know, we started living that way, like re- working remotely, but we didn't decide that we had like a book to write about it or something, you know, something sort of longer um, until we saw and, until the pandemic, because at that point, you know, we realized that like essentially everyone was speed running our experience that we had and our experience sort of you could uh, preface by my uh, talking about my biases in the beginning there my experience when we first started working from home was awful like it was i i I had a i had real difficulty getting uh getting myself um to you know to, to work in a different environment without the complete and total collapse of my 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 personal life basically i viewed work at, or remote work as a perk that had to be earned at all times. That if, you know, if I, for one second stepped off the job and, you know, and, and didn't, didn't do well, that I was going to be called back in like, Hey, you know, you, you have like, you're going to have to come back from Montana. That caused me to work so hard that I didn't enjoy any of, of the flexibility that, that I'd had like moved out there to enjoy. And the only thing that kind of fixed that was this real intentional hard work, including like self inventory of what it is that I I valued and like what was happening to me as a person. And what I realized asking you know talking with Annie, having those hard conversations was that like I was basically only living to work, and I had become this like one dimensional human being, and that that sort of led us down, down the path. And then, and then we started, you know, trying to incorporate um, like this flexibility into our working lives and into our personal lives that we had the luxury of doing that. Cause there wasn't a pandemic going on, but everyone else was just like trapped in this uh, and, and, and certainly didn't have that luxury. And so that's where we really thought like, Hey, maybe, you know, maybe we have some something that we can share with sort of a grounding personal anecdote. But then the book kind of turned into this, you know, this effort of of reporting, and and you know, took on like a life of its own. How are you? How are you seeing it, Annie? Yeah, I think that we've been doing this long enough at this point that all of us have been through these different seasons of working from home right? Like actual literal seasons in the summer where it feels like there is a little bit more freedom in terms of the spaces and, and the, the collaborations that were possible. A lot of people I know were able to work outside in some capacity, right? For even short bursts of time or to go on walks or have outdoor lunches with coworkers and regain some of those feelings of collaboration and togetherness and work culture that had been lost over the course of the pandemic. And then I think it gets, it like comes around and feels really bleak again last winter. And I think we're, we're feeling some of that too. Now. I also think that there are second layer effects that we're grappling with at this point in terms of people having worked from home and oftentimes had that extra layer of managing childcare, like while they're trying to work as well. And then also like trying to manage all the responsibilities of the workplace and then also feeling scared about the pandemic all the time that we are at a point of burnout where it's hard to disarticulate is the problem with my job, is the problem with my habits, is the problem with the fact that we're still working from home during the pandemic. Like all of these things are so intertwined that it's difficult to diagnose exactly what is making us feel like crap most of the time. Yeah. And speaking of burnout, we'll get to the 
writing background that you have, because that, that speaks to a lot of the generational issues here. Something I'm, before we transition into the actual book, Charlie, something I'm wondering, I don't remember if this was on Vox Conversations or um, Derek Thompson's podcast, but you referenced the fact that part of the reason why you all were able to move out to Montana was that 2017 era, let's get to know the country better, <laughs> we miss Trump. And you said it kind of flippantly. Um, so I'm curious, did you two come to understand the country better living in Montana and now living in Washington. I'm, I'm from Portland, Oregon, so I, I can say that, you know, I don't see that much difference like West Coast versus East Coast wise, but I'm just sort of curious about the the deeper thing behind what you were saying. I, I said that I said that flippantly only because of the fact that like, <laughs> I don't think we would have been able, like I, I it was, it was a good sort of like, um, it, <laughs> that moment, was making a lot of newsrooms feel pretty insecure. And it was like a, it, it, it was, it was a hook. I, I'm not flipping about the fact that like, I think living in places outside of the coast or, or, or just doing media outside of, outside of New York or, or Washington DC or LA. Like, I, I think that's broadly very helpful. I mean, I, I would say that the, the biggest thing for me, like, I, I don't want to, you know, say like, Oh, I learned what it is to be in real America. Right. Like, I would say the biggest thing that uh, from a reporting standpoint that I, that I learned and, and sort of a difference is like, was kind of climate based. And like, I, I really didn't understand the, you know, the wildfire ecosystem uh, uh, that, you know, the West has been dealing with. I think that's been, I mean, that's just like sort of one example for me of, you know, regionally specific issues in a, in a larger, you know, bigger sort of story that is really, really important. And I think this year, this past summer, since it got just so absolutely bad, I think the sort of national media kind of picked up on it a little more. And I think it's now, now an issue that people care about, but in 2020, um, it was actually on, uh, in, in September happened to be on my birthday, but that day when like San Francisco was just like bright orange, you know, it was like truly sort of like Blade Runner stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, I just remember that like, it, that was everywhere on Twitter, but like, it wasn't actually a ton of coverage of it in the, in the, in the national media. And I was like, man, you know, like we know when there's like a lot of rain and an afternoon in New York or Washington DC, <laughs> right? Like, it's just like, it's a bigger deal. And so I think, I think understanding, you know, some of these regionally specific problems that, you know, being an East coaster before this, I, I didn't, but I'm not going to say that it's like, um, you know, and I'm now in touch with, with, with real America in some way that makes me better than anyone else. <laughs> no one. And I wasn't trying to, I was just, totally, I, totally. I mean, it's, it's, cause it's interesting because it's because I think the reason why that whole shtick has become a cliche is that this became this thing where there's this metaphysical wisdom that one grains once one crosses the Rocky mountains or goes South of <laughs> Virginia, which is just funny. But, but Annie, here's, here's a question I have for you. Speaking of yeah. the country being a different place than the coasts. An interesting thing that comes through in the book is I feel like there's this shared assumption that the pandemic is something that is scary. The office is your standard style of commuting. Companies are pursuing specific policies. And, you know, Charlie, you know, you're at the Atlantic. Um, there was recently this piece by Matthew Walther that like went all over the place saying that like most of the country doesn't care about COVID anymore. So as you're thinking about this future of the office conversation, I'm a little less interested in like debating that piece, more just the idea of in places in the country where there definitely isn't as much pandemic, let's just say seriousness, yeah. why would the actual work style the office actually change. So like if I'm in like South Florida, why would any of this conversation matter at all? Yeah. So this is a great point. Uh, I will point out that, uh, so I'm from Idaho originally. That's part of the reason we moved to Montana is because it was a landscape and place that I like wanted to be closer to. And Missoula is, uh, has some of those components of Idaho that I missed with slightly better politics. And I mean, that's what I'll, that's what I'll say about that. But uh, I like where my mom lives in Northern Idaho, there's no pandemic, right? Or at least that's how people behave, right? Like all of this, this understanding of, of masking and of like, how do we 
conceive of masking in schools? How do we conceive of masking in indoor outdoor spaces? It's like, it's just not even a conversation. You know, you have a handful of individuals who are still masking and still behaving as if there is a pandemic. And then the vast majority of people are not behaving that way. But even with that, I do think that you still have considerations that are happening, whether it's on like the state level, like offices that are that are run by the state or federal workers, which is a much larger percentage of office workers than I think a lot of people uh, understand or acknowledge. And in states like Washington state, where in the Eastern half of the state, there are a lot of people who are behaving as if the pandemic has not happened, but they are still under the rules and regulations passed down by Governor Jay Inslee, which is like, you have to behave like a pandemic is still happening. That's the case in a fair amount of fair amount of locations. So whatever happens in terms of individual businesses or organizations in places, like if they might not care as much about the pandemic, I think that those are still the minority. The vast majority of organizations are more national organizations that have to make decisions that align with more national policies. And so I still think that this is a conversation very much worth having, even though you have a lot of smaller offices in smaller locations that are just have had people coming in for months. Right. Can can I also just add that? Like, I think, I think the fundamental, I I think it's, it's an important point, but your COVID politics almost matter a little less right now than, than the, um, like what we saw, like I, I look, I look at the, this, the pandemic with regard to remote work or flexible work or whatever we want to call it as this big control experiment, essentially, where like <laughs> we figured out what would happen. It was, it was the hypothetical, right? Like what mm-hmm. if for some reason there was a deadly virus and everyone had to, you know, just work, work from home, the whole like knowledge or white collar workforce had to work from home. What would happen? We kind of played that out. Right. And I think that that, what I've been saying in a lot of these interviews about the book is that like, I think that is sort of the, the, the spark here for anything else, which is that there was this sort of myth that the office was the nucleus that held everything together. And if you took people out of that productivity would plummet, you know, corporate cultures would erode to such an extent that we'd be, you know, like flailing and just like at totally adrift and at sea in, in, in a business sense, right. in like a profit line sense. And what we saw is that that's bogus, like that, that didn't happen. And so I think like, it doesn't really matter what your politics are. Like we've, we've proved in this experiment sort of broadly as a nation and, and globally in, in a lot of cases that like the office, while still probably important in ways is not important in the way that we thought it was. So it doesn't really matter if, you know, you believe that the pandemic's happening or not, like you have this opportunity to try to address and, and make changes like dynamic changes to the way that your organization operates and you can either choose to do that or you can choose not to. I really appreciate the one, two punch you two just gave because what you're, what I'm hearing is even if you're the reddest of red States, you probably don't want to commute if you don't have to commute and you're not right. going to, and and you're not, and, and just because you don't like masking doesn't mean you're going to want to charge into the office. Um, if the underlying value proposition isn't quite as clear. So I think, I think that's really helpful. Yeah, totally. Unless we like politicize commuting now too. So it's like commute to, <laughs> commute own, to the own the lives. <laughs> okay, nice. Yeah, that was good. I like that. I like that. I want to I want a commute-based culture war. Let's do it. <laughs> no, like that, that's well, but actually once again, keep to building on what's useful there. It's we're actually seeing what the limits of cultural signaling are. So for example, like whether you wear your masks outside, whether you do that, there are always ways that people are signaling in different functions, but I think commuting to like office-based practices probably would be that red line because that's okay. So that's, so that's actually interesting. So let's, let's actually get to what the pandemic and this great experiment effectively proved then, because it, it seems from my perspective, this is a little hard because I'm a podcaster. So the, the, <laughs> the, yeah. So, so 15 an different things. You're, right. a, you're an essential worker. Is what yeah. I'm an, essential, I'm an essential worker when it comes to our discourse shortage, but basically like as, as we're thinking about this, the pandemic meant that I do everything over zoom. Now I could record three episodes a day. You get a nice mic and you're pretty much good to go. But for everyone else, how did that actually play out when it came to white collar workers? Because I think at a generational level, I do not know that many people in their 20s and early 30s who are quite happy with what's happening right now. So how do you two think about that? 
Yeah, I'm a little bit older. I just turned 40, elder millennial. And most of my friends have kids, young kids, and they were miserable, right? Because for the very early part of the pandemic, there was no childcare. And then childcare was, uh, you know, intermittent, uh, or disappeared for various periods of time. Like it just sucked. And the reality that I think we keep coming back to is that whatever the last two years were, and this is true if you were a parent or if you were you're younger and you were like super lonely working from home, that's not what the future has to be, right? Like the future is going to be a very different composition of, of work and working from home, working remotely, working flexibly. It's going to be that combination of sometime in the office and sometime not in the office. And it's going to be a lot of work outside of the confines of your home if you want that, right? If you are a more social worker who wants to be in the presence of other people, of other noises, and needs that change of scenery, those are all things that are open to you. Yeah, I I don't have a ton more to add other than like we say pretty early on in the book and we've said in a whole bunch of different articles and newsletters, whatever, things that we've written that like this is not this is not the, 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 the promise of working from home. Like it's, it's not hiding away from a virus or, you know, zoom schooling your kids while you're trying to do this. Like, and, and, and that means like, I, I think there's, a, there's an issue to all like knowledge work or what, or white collar work is privileged work to, to begin with. It is a 40% probably max right now of the workforce that can do that. So already it's a gilded thing, but within that, there is this stratification of of the privilege, right? You work at Google, you're going to get amazing, you know, like perks and, you know, they might not even cut your salary if you say you want to move wherever. So now you're living in, you know, wherever, Montana, Idaho, and you're making, you know, San Francisco uh, salaries and, and, and you're just, you know, you can buy a huge house, all that stuff. And then other people are going to have work bosses who, you know, are terrible and say like, fine, this is a perk, but I'm going to lord it over you. And you have to install this employee monitoring software and Mm -hmm. it's going to track your eyes and your keyboard strokes. And you're going to be like, you know, absolutely miserable. So there's going to be this huge stratification in terms, in terms of what's going on, but there will be something fundamentally different when we turn, when we like turn a corner of the pandemic for like, and and it could, you know, be coming soon even, um, and we have a little more like freedom in how we can move and operate it. And, and a lot of people feel more comfort and they can sort of try to, those pr- with the privilege can start designing, you know, their, their work days a little bit more and trying to fill the, uh, trying to sort of position them around things in their life that matter to them. So I, I just don't think we're like, I, I don't think we've really seen what the promise looks like most, most people. What's interesting here is the reference to Google salaries, because um, Annie, I think this was you, but you were referring in an interview to bosses talking about time theft and people, you know, not spending time. There's that famous Wall Street Journal article that made everyone laugh where people are stacking five jobs on top of each other and effectively explaining the fact that they only really require two to three hours of work when you've gotten rid of the commute and all those different parts. I want to be a little unfair and speak up for the employer here. What actually is this? Like how I'm not even speaking with the employer. Like how, how should we calculate value when this and when, when the seat in the, like when the time and seat math is just so off because time theft is unfair because that suggests that people just chose to live in this world and they didn't. But mm. the good faith thing that's happening there is that the employer is saying, the math here doesn't see, like, let me put it this way. If people are, and not everyone is doing this, but if there are a subset of people who are stacking up jobs on top of each other, that reveals that time and then value of your time is not being calculated. So maybe that means that person with five jobs should be paid $250,000 a year instead of like 90 hours a year at one place. But how do we think about how we should recalculate this math? Yeah, I I do think it's a good question. I think whoever that person is taking five jobs is probably doing all five of those jobs really poorly right? They're doing them adequately. They're like the person on your team that at work, who's like, everyone's like, oh, that guy like is never checked in. Um, Because I think the thing about work is that to do it really well, you also need rest. And this is what uh, 
I think like labor organizers have understood for a very long time. You know, the old slogan was eight hours for work, eight hours for rest, eight hours for what you will. And that was understood as a balanced work day. And then also, you know, labor ever. Labor advocates are also responsible for advocating for the six-day work week and then the five-day work week. And none of these things are fixed, right? Automation should make it possible so that we have less work and more rest. But the rest itself, to look at it in a very like utilitarian fashion, the rest is for us, like for, for people to be people, to have lives outside of our ability and capacity to labor. But it also makes you a better worker especially in quote unquote knowledge work, where so much of our work is contingent, not just on presence, but on clear thinking, creative thinking, concise thinking, all of these things that go down when you don't have enough rest built into the schedule. So for me, if someone says, okay, over the course of the week, here are your deliverables. Like here are the things that we expect of you in terms of the, like, the amount of copy we want you to write the amount of podcasts we want you to put into the world. If you can conceive of a schedule that allows you to put out two, three really good podcasts, and then the rest of the time is you you reading for pleasure, you reading for work, but also for pleasure, you walking around, staring at the wall, being with friends, doing things that in some ways inform your work, but in other ways do not, is that... Yeah, you know, are you stealing wages from yourself by not having all of those hours dedicating specifically to the work of podcasting? It's just an interesting thought experiment, I think, and it's worth talking about. And you know what's really tough here, though, and I'll let you follow up on this, Charlie. I have the privilege of having a very deliberable, focused work style. So like you said it yourself, produce three podcasts. This is actually what I do. Produce yeah. <laughs> three to five podcasts a week. If they're turned in, I did my job. But I think what's so difficult for most white collar workers is most people, especially 20 somethings don't have, I think journalists also have this privilege too, where it's like produce your copy, Charlie, write your newsletter. But if you're in this like vague, semi bullshit job space, that's <laughs> where you're really having a bad time right now. Yeah. So, you know, it's the, the whole value thing is really interesting. And like, I think, I think it's, I think the pandemic has made abundantly clear that like societally our sense of, of value and what kind of work we value is, is just like, couldn't be more out of whack, right? Like high frequency traders and, and what they, you know, give to society versus like, you know, frontline care work and things like that. And I think, I think like, that's something that we all just like kind of can't unsee. And yet we're going to try to do our best to just, you know, put it under the rug. Um, but what, what I'll say about this kind of touches on what you just mentioned, a, a, a piece of the book, which is that like the real problems with management and it just broadly in, in, you know, white collar workforces. And especially this idea of like, we, it's a phenomenon we call add on management essentially, but it's like that the middle management layer is just like chock full of people who've been promoted because they were very good at their specific working, like worker level job. And someone said, Hey, do you want to be a manager? Oftentimes they've also said, do you want to keep doing your job and manage a team? And also like, we're not really like, we're not really going to train you that much. We're not really going to, in, in some cases, even totally tell you like what it is you're in charge of here. Just like you get this team to be as good as you were at what you did. And what we, what we've seen time and time again is that and this is like talking to like HR, you know, uh, consultants and people like that. Middle managers don't really know what their job is to the extent of like, I don't even know if I'm in my senior management. Am I like, like, what, like, where am I in, in that? And th as a result, most of their direct reports don't really know what their jobs are. And I'm, I'm not like being like flippant. It's like, I'm sort of sure that like, I know that like, this is generally what's expected of me, but like, am I excelling? Like, are there things that I'm leaving on the table? And it creates this whole sense of precarity mm -hmm. among a lot of people that they just constantly feel like, 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 you know, someone's going to come in one day and just be like, all right, that's it. Like, you know, here's the door you're, you're done. Cause you, you failed at your job. And this sort of lack of communication there between man, like especially the middle layer of managers and all this and, and workers, but also like executives and the middle managers and their bosses, this like chain of just poor communication leads to 
what you're talking about, which is people who exist in this like sh- crappy, mushy, like middle where they don't really know what's expected of them every, every day. And it leads to that exactly what, what you're talking about, which is, um, you know, being miserable or, or just performing your job all the time. Right. Like, okay, I guess I'll just wake up in the morning and send emails for nine hours because like, at least that'll make it look like I'm we're doing something. And so what we talk about in the book is like, that this moment, this sort of like rethinking of some of the first principles of work, because remote work requires you to be more intentional and you don't have the office to like rely on that tap on the shoulder thing is like talking, having managers like understand what their jobs are, retraining them in the actual art of management and having these real honest conversations that sound really silly like first principles conversations of, hey, let's just talk about what it is that you do and what's expected of you. And like, I'm going to tell you very clearly, this is what your deliverable thing is. You know, like guy who does sales, you know, <laughs> like whatever whatever that is. And I think that that's, it, it sounds so dumb, but I think it's like at the heart of a lot of people who are just miserable in their organizations and sort of feel like they're, you know, tap dancing all the time just to like, you know, perform and look good. You know, it's funny. Uh, I just listened to a really good oral history of the office and another way of describing the add on management thing you're describing folks excel at the job and get promoted. This is literally the character of Michael Scott um, in the sense that he is an excellent, excellent, excellent salesman, but he's promoted to be a middle manager and he's horrible at it. Um, so it, it's just, it's just funny. Like this is a, this is a, this is a real uh, f- phenomenon. Um, and he's something I'd like to talk about. And you just referenced it is this uh, is, is like labor organization um, in a different podcast. You referred to these as guardrails, like referencing the fact that in Western states on mountains, you'll have a, you'll have a guardrail. But what's interesting here, and this also fits the two of your biographies is a lot of what you were talking about in that podcast appearance. So for example, no emails, hypothetically after 8 PM government passing regulations and laws presumes a stability of the workplace that doesn't (laughs) exist for a lot of people. So Charlie, you're, you know, you're at the Atlantic now, but you were an independent content. I hate it's so terrible, cliched, terrible word. You're an independent content creator. You're part of the creator <laughs> economy, Charlie. You're, 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 you're yeah. hanging your shingle. You're building the creator middle smash class. That like like this, <laughs> smash that like button, all this, all this stuff, you know, like we're, we can't say hustle culture here, but like directionally hustle culture here. But in that scenario, if you look at the people who talk about this future creator economy, people who used to like, we would be evangelists for a gig economy. There is no boss sending an eight o'clock email. There is no, you know, if you're not writing your newsletter, someone else is writing your newsletter, especially in these busy spaces. So how how do we balance the fact that for most people, especially my more ambitious, frankly, burnt out friends, they're not in a situation where there is an equivalent of a law that could be passed that would deal with the specific precarity they're going through. So how do you how do you just think about this broadly? Yeah. Well, I think we've internalized those bad bosses, right? Like sometimes like the, the analog to this is like, so over the course of the 2000s, 2010s, uh, paparazzi culture spread so massively and so quickly with the spread of digital paparazzi, like the ease with which paparazzi could capture images of the stars, but also just the spread of, you know, high quality cameras, that sort of thing. And what the celebrities did instead of like actually making images of themselves uh, rare, right? Instead of sheltering themselves in most cases from the paparazzi is they internalized the logic of the paparazzi. They just started taking pictures of themselves at all times, right? At least the most successful. Is this Instagram? Are you referring to like Instagram and stuff? Yeah, Instagram and social media. Like they internalized paparazzi. They became their own paparazzi. There's actually this hilarious, looking back now, like very early Twitter, Ashton Kutcher, early adopter of Twitter, celebrity Twitter, one of his declarations was like, we are taking back our own paparazzi. And it felt powerful, I think, to celebrities at the time to be like, you know what? You're not going to take pictures of us anymore. We're going to take pictures of ourselves and we're going to control the narrative. And so I think this is oftentimes 
the rhetoric, the understanding within quote unquote hustle culture or independent contractor, independent creator culture, which is increasing like a huge number of workers, right? Not even just people who are working on the internet, creating content in that capacity, but also just like the freelance economy, right? More and more people are independent contractors in this capacity, but many of us have come to understand that the only way that we survive is by working all the time, right? By being our own worst bosses. And so what are the things that can relieve that feeling of instability, the the feeling that you need to always be growing because the bottom could fall out at any moment and you (laughs) you could lose everything? I mean, I can think of a few things that actually are things that you can put into place through legislation, through policy, that would make people feel more stable. And they start with something like decoupling healthcare from employment, but also continue to larger, more interesting experiments like UBI. How about you, Charlie? How do you, I, 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 not dunked on you, but I, I mocked a certain uh, iteration <laughs> of you and, and you, and you I, never, and you were always very open about this, so I'm not making fun of you when I dunk on I, content yeah. creator stuff, but <laughs> I, <laughs> respond to the I meme not, of you. <laughs> I don't feel dunked on, just so you know. I feel I feel very much. Um, uh, uh, anyway, uh, so <sighs> I think it. I mean, I, th- I think it's. I think it's difficult. There's there's been a little bit of writing that I haven't engaged fully with, but um, but I I mean it it does sort of seem like all all work is is trending towards gig work right and like there are there are parts of that that like the flexibility of that the the promise of that that could that could be great in that kind of creator space but i do think i like i do think then there has to be like a creator labor movement that needs to happen like i think there needs to be and and it's really difficult in in this you know I was talking to a couple of people who are like bullish about like a creator labor movement. And it's like, yeah, well, you know, like think about what, you know, some of these platforms, like if the biggest names like go away from them, right. Like what, what they're going to uh, like, they're going to have, they have a lot of leverage uh, in, in these situations because they're, they have huge, huge audiences and, and these, you know, like YouTube needs name your Mr. name. Your, Beast. Your, sure. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Mr. Beast. Like, but also maybe, maybe not, you know, and, and, and I think when you look at, you know, like it's really disheartening to me to look at the way that TikTok treats creators, like their creator fund, I think is like a pool of a billion dollars. And like, it doesn't matter if your views increase or whatever, like they're just going to meet out. Like if, if, if TikTok's revenue increases, like they're not going to pay out more than a billion dollars in that year. Whereas like YouTube's is actually just like, we're going to give you, I think it's like, 56% or something like that. It's of, not bad. Of the it's, revenue. It's, no, yeah, yeah, it's not, it's, it's not terrible, but again, it's like, that's like TikTok's the next iteration. Right. And it's not like it's getting better for creators. It's actually, it's worse. Um, and, and there is, so I'm, 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 I'm a little bit worried about it. I mean, I think that, that if you, if there's a, a concern that we both have in this book, it is that all of the things that make this potential future promising, like it has to happen in tandem with some like policies that give people a bit of a safety net so that they feel like they can actually, you know, make, have that ability to make their lives flexible. Right. I I'm not saying that you can't do things for yourself or that employers can't do things to make work better for people. And I think it's worth listing those out and talking about that future. But if you're talking about like a, a real wholesale change that really actualizing the promise, like you do need, I think, to decouple healthcare from, from, from a job, because if you're so worried that, you know, you're going to be sent into potential financial ruin or a family member of yours, you know, could, could get sick and die as the result of you getting fired, you're not going to, you know, be able to to um, to you know have the privilege of of redesigning your life in some of these ways. So, and I think that extends all the way down. I, but yeah, I, I don't know. I was just I was just rambling there. But I think it's I think there's a lot of 
there's a lot that we really have to work out there. And I do think that a lot of work is going to start looking more like gig work, like work that traditionally didn't. And our labor laws have not caught up to that reality. Like this is the primary difficulty is mm-hmm. that labor laws have like are still in place as if we the vast majority of needs for labor protections are still like people working in factories. And when, just to, uh, yeah, go ahead. And just to add some quick context here, because I want the audience to realize that when when you're talking about like creators and the dynamics that you're referring to, this isn't just a like inside baseball thing. If you know, um, like Josh Constein, someone I re- like really respect, he's at Signal Fire. He was at TechCrunch. Like his firm has a whole report saying, you know, like hypothetically, 50 million Americans could ta- their jobs could take on some aspect of the types of work we see people who are like YouTubers or who are on Instagram or TikTok. So like in the same way that not everyone's an Uber driver, there still are aspects of that 1099 contractor role that's going. So that's why the, that, that, that's, this is actually why the, the discussion matters. But, but, but Annie, I'll just throw this to you then again. Unionization is obviously very low. It's because the, the economy's really changed. How do we conceive of unions in a world where a frank other way of describing these gig workers is that everyone is essentially a business of themselves. So I yeah. am a business of Marshall Kozlov. Charlie, obviously you went to the Atlantic, but you still made, um, you know, galaxy brain. So technically speaking, that's still a business decision. You're not, you're not merely just an employer's employee. Yeah. So when well, he's an independent does, contractor too, at the so Atlantic. There it is. So literally, yeah. so then how, how does solidarity work when we're not actually workers, but we're all our own businesses who are actually in weird ways semi competing against? How how do we? And this is why you're not rambling, Charlie, because the answer is no one's figured this out. So yeah, if you had a perfectly coherent <laughs> narrative, I probably that. think you were a hack. <laughs> so like, just think out loud, like Annie. Like, how do we? How do we just conceive of this? I mean, this is this is such a good question. So something I've been thinking about lately is the fact that I have. So I I write a newsletter, Culture Study, that is my primary source of income. And uh, I, Charlie and I are are incorporated. We are an S-corp, right? And it has taken me at least this past year to start thinking of that income, not as personal income, but as business income. It's certainly taxed as business income, right? Like the, the freelance rates, the 1099 tax rates are still conceived of, like they're just, a, they're very, very high. And the only way to make those rates go down that is commiserate with those people who are employed through corporations is through, you know, thinking of yourself as a business and understanding your business expenses as business expenses, right? So books that I buy, business expenses, a calendar, a planner that I buy, that is part of my larger business. But that mandatory thinking is, as you point out, really contrary to thinking of yourself in solidarity with other workers. And I wonder if part of it is like, I don't know, in like Missoula, they have a very vibrant downtown association where you have all sorts of different types of businesses. Like you have banks, you have a running store, you have restaurants, all of these sorts of things that are doing their own work and attracting different clientele. But they also understand that they're collective fate is dependent upon people coming downtown and also spreading that business around. Like what's good for one place there is good for everyone. Like they, they come together as a collective in that way. And so I'm wondering too, how within this larger individual business creator economy or, or contractor economy, how we can think of what's best for one of us as actually being what's best for all of us. I think, I think too, when we think about it from like, from the creator standpoint, right. And from some of this, like these, like these online jobs that are just so like, you know, you're kind of like riding the algorithmic and attentional waves, right. Like that's a little bit of what this, what this business is to some degree. Um, I think what, what, since we are still in like the early days of it, like, I think there are a lot of people who are, who are branching out because like, there's a lot of potential money to be made, right? Like, and, and like lots of, of money, like some of the earliest people to it have that sort of structural advantage, right? And they, they can come in and they can, you know, make hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars doing, doing all this stuff. And then the people who come in sort of on the second part of the wave, there's still a lot of money there, right? But it's like, maybe it's not, it's not that kind of like, it doesn't have the almost like, and I'm not, I'm not knocking like, 
anyone here. Like doesn't have like the get rich quick kind of feel to it. Right. Like yeah. a lot of people started newsletters in part because they're like, well, like crap. Glenn if Greenwald I can make, made if a I million make, dollars. Yeah. I better do this. <laughs> if, I, if I can make like 35 times what I'm making and also have that freedom, like that sounds like a pretty good deal. That That's what I mean by get rich quick. But anyway, I think what a lot of people are seeing self very much included on Substack is like, there was certainly money there, but it wasn't that like order of magnitude amount of money, right? Um, it, and so I think you might see people coming together in those spaces, right? Like, and and because of the fact that it's like, well, okay, so maybe this isn't like, this isn't a way for me to make oodles of money, but it's a way for me to have that freedom I want, make comfortable money. And I look at like Defector and that that cooperative, that media cooperative model which you know what they're doing really in- interesting could you, work. Could you, could you, we're getting niche here in a good way, but can you explain defector? We haven't mentioned. Yeah. That so before. it's basically a, a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of um, staffers from the website Deadspin. Um, it got bought by, um, uh, I can't remember who bought it. Anyway, it got yeah. bought by a media conglomerate. They put in, you know, s- somebody who basically did not uh just like a, a, a media suit uh, who did not, you know, have understand really what the the secret sauce of, of that website was caused a lot of the beloved staffers to quit, uh, resign in mass. And then uh, they formed a, a media cooperative uh, and they publish now and they charge subscriptions and stuff, but it's, it's like a big, I mean, other people have done this too, but it's like, it's a big sub stack that you pay for. Right. And they're profitable no one is making tons of like Greenwald levels of money, but everyone's comfortable. They're doing what they what they care, what they, they want to do. And um, I think that that is something that we we might be able to see in terms of in terms of like solidarity. Like right now, the media ecosystem is forcing a lot of people to be like into that sort of individualist thing. And I think in part because like you know it has that gold rush mentality. There is, you know, a lot like you can strike out on your own and 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 do that. But as that sort of comes back to earth a little bit, I think you'll see people say like, like start to find solidarity in that in that idea of like, well, we are we are stronger, you know, together here. Um, I, I could be wrong, but I think that that I think that will happen more and more. And this is just sort of like we're kind of you know coming up to like a, a maturation of that like. Oh wow, my job can be influencer, uh, you know, in X way. And and Annie, I wanna I wanna give people news they can use because the reason why the conversation around journalists and creators matter is because the central feature here is that we're seeing the value proposition change. So it used yeah. to be that all the value was in the company, all the value was in the brand, but what Charlie, you're going through, what you actually what the three of us go through because we, we you know, we we run businesses that are businesses of ourselves is we realize that we actually as individuals have a lot more of the value proposition than in the past. So I'm curious, how is that? And a lot of that's enabled by the internet, obviously. So you, you can distribute all your newsletter for free. You don't need the New York times and their delivery trucks to do that for you. Therefore the value prop changed because of um, digital uh, getting rid of scarcity. How does this idea apply to just normal white collar workers. So how are we seeing during the pandemic and the remote era, the value proposition and a people's individual value shift and change? Yeah, I think it's an employee market right now, right? There are a lot of employers who are looking for jobs that they need filled for various reasons. You know, there's good data out there released in the last month that the great resignation was actually a lot more weighted in term like over in the the retail and restaurant sector so most of the people who were quitting their jobs and then finding new ones were people who were doing those sorts of uh non-office jobs but i do think that the spirit of the great resignation is still very much in place in workforce in workplaces workplaces right now are kind of scrambling to figure out okay, how do we keep our existing employees? How do we reduce turnover? How do we figure out how to stay competitive with these other workplaces? And part of that is trying to figure out what the the road forward is when it comes to flexible work scenarios. So I think if you see like offices that are super rigid about like everyone is going back into the office now, people are going to quit. 
they or they might stay for a while and then they're going to quit, right? They might start putting up feelers, finding other places. Anecdotally, I know a lot of people or I've heard from a lot of people who are like, as soon as, as soon as these back to the office implementations like actually go into place, I have to find a new job because I'm not going back into the office nine to five ever again in my life. And I think right now you also see uh, app, open application, like jo- open jobs that are fully remote, hundreds and hundreds of applications for those jobs. Whereas the positions at places that are are requiring people to have a much more rigid schedule are really struggling to fill those positions. So it's the way forward. Like you can't, it's a stupid cliche, but you can't put the genie back in the bottle. Like it's, it's similar in a lot of ways to how entitlements have worked historically in the United States that like once you give people or you offer or you create something like social security or Medicare, you can't take that away, right? Like people, there would be uproar. So there's no going backwards from this place where we've realized that flexible work is possible. It's not perfect yet by any means, but it is possible. And here's what I want to, this is like the big idea I want to, I want to close on as we're getting to the last few minutes here. Annie, a lot of your writing really focused on the role that the Great Recession played in shaping the millennial generation. Um, Charlie, you you referenced in one of your recent Galaxy Brains on Facebook. It's actually really interesting what about Facebook being in this like empty mid hours thing is you know watching TV in high school back in the aughts. So I'll make some assumptions about your age. Um, so so talk about um, a like the way the Great Recession really shaped everything, and then b the way you see. Not, not, not. I'm not curious about a prediction because no one likes predictions. But how you just genuinely see, especially with. Let me put it this way: Great Recession really shaped millennials. It seems as if like Gen Zs who are in college, about to go to college, or recently entered the workforce, will be impacted at a several level, similar level because of this. How is everyone, um, Annie first, then Charlie? How is everyone reacting to this? Um, and how do you think? And how could are different ways that you could see this shaping the country? Yeah. So I hate the phrase empathy in the workforce. I wrote a piece for time a couple of months ago about like what a garbage word and garbage concept it is just generally. But at the same time, I wonder if those of us who are a little bit further along in our careers, whether in our late twenties or early thirties or forties can think back of what it must feel, feel like to go into the start of your career with no infrastructure of career in place, right? So you finish college and college, the end of college is pretty weird because it was in a pandemic and you're just hoping for some sort of rooting, some sort of grounding and there's nothing, right? Either you start a job remotely and you have no idea what is expected of you, what the norms are, what like what is your day supposed to look like? Am I ever going to have friends again? Or you're still trying to look for a job and trying to figure out what your future looks like. And so I, I try to like think about how unmooring that will be, that is, and how that's going to affect this entire generation. I think it's going to be the defining trait of adulthood for many of these students who are graduated from high school or college into the pandemic in this moment. And we won't know the full ramifications for several years, but I think it's really worth thinking about now. And quick follow up on that. What yeah. was the defining trait of millennials who graduated college during the Great Recession? Because I, I was I graduated high school in 2010, so I missed so I missed it. But what what was the defining trait in my generation's context? Just like any sort of work that you're given, you need to be grateful, no matter how exploitative it is, because at least it's a job, <laughs> at least it's something. I mean, this is I remember writing for free, feeling gratitude to write content for websites for free because it's, you know, exposure. And then the first time I was paid a hundred dollars for a 7,000 word feature, I thought it was the best thing that had ever happened. And part of that was like (laughs) the training that academia had, had put inside of me, which is that like, you should labor for free all the time. But part of that too, was the reality of the post-recession online marketplace, which is that No, like no one's going to pay you. And if you do get paid, no matter what it is, be grateful. And at any moment, everything could fall out beneath you, which is why I think in a lot of ways, the beginning of the recession in particular, when it was so uncertain what was going to happen with offices and the economy was really re-traumatizing for a lot of millennials. 
So I don't want to, I, I get excited about the, the, about like Gen Z's attitude towards a lot of this stuff. And I, <laughs> and the one thing I don't want to do is like really against being like the, the, the kids are all right, man, they're going to save us. Um, or, or, or like, or like all of Gen Z is just this one person who's addicted to TikTok and blah, blah, blah. It's like, 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 I really understand that, that, that generations are, 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 diverse and different and diverse and yes. different yeah exactly yes. in, in, in all of the possible ways like and i'm not I, I, so i'm prefacing what i'm saying there one of the most exciting things i think and again it's all really anecdotal is the that a lot of people are graduating into the workforce and they are taking a look around and they're like okay so everyone's miserable um there is precarity everywhere. Like the millennials are just like clearly screwed up in like very big ways and have these really, <laughs> you know, awful attitudes towards work, but also we're like, like there's like a Stockholm syndrome thing happening, which is like what Annie's kind of describing. Right. So yeah. like, they're not really like, they don't even want to quit their jobs. They just yeah. like, they're just yeah. buy, like, they're just not having kids and buying dogs. Right. Because like they're, they're just terrified and need something to hold on to. Um, I think they're seeing, I think they're seeing their, 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 parents who you know are also just like pretty burned out and having and having difficulties i think they're seeing like that there's just not you know when you get into the history of it not having nearly as many labor protections as the generations before this sort of idea that like the standard of living is like slowly going down or you're just going to have to work that much harder for it um and i think they're saying like okay so i do this and I align all of my self-worth with a career for 40 years. And then at the end of that, I can like hopefully have enough money saved up to like go do the thing that I want to do or enjoy my life in some way. And they're saying like, that's a bad deal. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm, I'm painting with a too broad of a brush here, but I think that there's a sort of a sentiment there. And that is... I think super profound. And you're just like, again, all anecdotal, you're seeing this in, in workplaces where like there's an all hands meeting. Right. And like, and this is also younger millennials too, I think. And they're talking about like, okay. And like, this is the paid leave plan. And like, you know, there's kind of like a smirk from like the executives that are like, we're adding one more week for fathers or whatever. And like, someone will like raise their hand and be like, this policy is offensive. Like explain to me like why, like, like why this is. And like I've actually, I've been in workplaces where, where that kind of things happen. And like the executives are kind of taken aback. It's like, Whoa, like, I can't believe they, they talk to me like that. And they don't know really what to do. And I think it's put a lot, like a lot of, you know, companies on their back foot that like, there's, there's a lot more pressure and a lot more people speaking up to this idea. And just broadly speaking are like, I don't want to tolerate all of this crap for in perpetuity. And I think, I, I don't know, I, I don't know where that goes. Maybe that just gets, you know, sort of like drummed out of people as they have to just labor on. Right. But I think there's something, there's something there. I think it has to do with real fears, existential fears about a climate that seems more and more inhospitable. You know, I, I think like a political system that seems pretty broken without a lot of, you know, uh, hope in sight. And I think people just saying like, what do we have to lose here in trying to advocate for just like a, a way forward that, that doesn't openly suck and that isn't, you know, is openly inequitable. Um, and I think, I, I don't know, I, I'm really, I'm really excited about that. And I do think that it, it, it runs more along the generational lines because they don't have that, that millennial Stockholm syndrome. And I'm really, so two quick things as we take out one, Annie, I just want to highlight for folks like reading, cause I, I, I missed, I missed like early 2010s digital media by two or three years. Thank God, because it's actually just wild. The amount of work people were putting in for such weak, terrible, and this is why everyone works in PR now. Cause it's like, well, quick. Yes, <laughs> that, yes, that, that's, that's why you, you'll see, you'll look at people's LinkedIn. You're like, man, like fascinating. Um, but you know, and to your point, Charlie, I, I, I'm, I'm glad you left 
and closed of how open it is right now because the reason why I enjoy the book so much is the, the idea is this is a this is a toolbox for p- folks to like work this out. There is no Gen Zs will do this, millennials will do that. We're all in these own unique and different situations. So I think this is very well valued. I can't recommend this book enough. Um, thank you so much for joining the show and uh, best of luck um, with the rest of the holidays. I love this conversation. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. This is great. I had, I had a blast.